Hello and welcome back to the second installment of this video series. In this video, we are going to be covering the Chamber of Secrets, where two major themes play out, the introduction of house elves and the continuation of pure bloodedness, which is a central theme of this book. Before I begin, however, I showed this video series to some of my closest friends, and they asked, why am I trying to ruin Harry Potter? Why am I politicizing it? Well, I didn't politicize it. The left politicized Harry Potter, but they took it a step further. They weaponized Harry Potter to attack right-wing ideas. And I am simply trying to defend those ideas and dispel these misconceptions that the left have drawn. They, the left, seek to warp the truth, to deny the truth, to block out the truth, to stick their fingers in their ears and ignore the truth, whereas I seek to tell the truth and I won't apologize for doing so. With that said, let's begin. The story begins when Harry is visited by Dobby, the house elf, who comes to warn Harry of returning to Hogwarts. Harry doesn't know anything about house elves, and so his initial interaction with Dobby is one that is both kind and respectful. Immediately, this causes Dobby some distress, as he compares Harry's behavior to that of his masters. Why don't you sit down? Sit down. Sit, sit down. <laughs> Dobby, shush. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend you or anything. Offend Dobby? Dobby has heard of your greatness, sir. But never has he been asked to sit down by a wizard. Like an equal. It is readily said that his masters were highly cruel, forcing Dobby to punish himself whenever he disobeyed their orders. But, as Harry rightly points out, he suggests that perhaps he hasn't met any decent wizards before. And Dobby agrees. In the book, Dobby is quickly related back to the Malfoys. Ron, Fred and George comment how house elves were only owned by those extremely wealthy. And associating Dobby with the Malfoys is cause to further villainize them. Now Dobby's treatment and conditions is clearly meant to mirror or at least bring up thoughts about slavery but not slavery as it is accurately depicted in books and scholarly works, but rather slavery as it is depicted through Hollywood films and social media. Dobby wears a pillow sack and he could only be freed if his master were to give him clothes. He was constantly abused, punished, and was obviously forced to work for the Malfoys without pay, often performing rather menial tasks, such as shining Lucius's shoes. Now, if we compare this to black slavery in the United States, this is a misrepresentation. But before we get into those arguments, I'd like to make the point that slavery was a common practice in many ancient civilizations, such as Egypt, Rome, Greece, and Persia, to name a few. The majority of these slaves were white, and is perhaps the reason they aren't spoken about much today. Furthermore, Europeans did not entertain slavery in their countries, and were responsible for its abolition. With that said, let's look at some of the facts concerning black slaves in America in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Now, I'd like to recommend checking out Academic Agent on YouTube, who did a very good video looking at the comparison between 19th century slaves and minimum wage workers today, the link for which will be in the description below. Getting into the facts now, slaves were granted clothes food, and shelter. They were allowed to build a separate lodging for themselves and their family under the supervision of the master. And the masters of these slaves were extremely wealthy, so that the lodgings they built were rather accommodating and of good standard. According to first-hand accounts, slaves were granted lunch together with provisions to make breakfast and dinner. Furthermore, slaves were allowed to hunt or grow their own crops to supplement their meals and archaeological data suggests that their diets were extremely similar to that of their masters, and that this phenomenon was widespread across the populace. Even though slaves were not paid, they were granted many more amenities than the average freeman. All their bills were paid for. Bills for shelter, bills for food, clothing, but also medical bills, which the average freeman would not have been able to afford. Furthermore, when slaves became disabled or too old to work, they were looked after by their masters, often allowed to take on less physically demanding jobs. Free men, on the other hand, 
spend more than half their wages on a food and shelter alone, which can be confirmed by a budget study done in Mississippi. Next, we can look at the abuse that the slaves suffered. First-hand accounts show that over 95% of slaves had never been whipped in their lifetimes, and this follows logically since slaves were extremely expensive. One had to purchase them at a fairly high price, and then also consider the overhead involved with providing them food, shelter, clothing, medical bills, and paying taxes. It seemed highly unlikely that one would whip or flog a slave when they incurred such a cost. Furthermore, flogging and whipping were forms of punishment for crimes. It was an alternative to jail. It was not done as wantonly as depicted in Hollywood movies. In addition to all this, when slavery was abolished, those same slaves returned to work on the very same plantations under the same masters and stay in the same living quarters they had previously. All of this being said, I am not trying to defend slavery. And I reiterate that, I am not trying to defend slavery, but rather point out the common misconceptions that are usually construed with the topic. And clearly these misconceptions were adopted by Rowling in writing the character Dobby. So one should really try to avoid drawing the parallel between how Dobby is treated versus how the average slave was treated. Again, to find out more information, check out Academic Agent on YouTube. There will be more to say on how selves later on. Dobby is simply the first of many to be introduced within the series, as we will see. And Dobby is the exception and not the rule. Most of the house elves enjoy working for their masters and don't wish to be freed. This will be exampled in Winky and Creature later on. Furthermore, it seems that wizards discriminate against the house elves and view them as lesser creatures, which would also be exampled in Winky, but also another house elf known as Hoki later on. But we will delve into all of this when we arrive at those points. For now, let's move on. Following the story, Harry arrives at the Borough, which raises another topic. Another theme that is introduced leading into the major theme of this book is that those rich aristocratic people are viewed as the villains, and the poor Weasley family are viewed as kind and loving people. Now this message is rather interesting, because those rich families like the Blacks, the Lestranges, and the Malfoys don't seem to line up with their rich counterparts in the world today, the likes of Bezos, Musk, Gates, and Zuckerberg, who are the billionaires of today. Don't push any sort of idea that would be close to pure bloodedness. In fact, they would push the opposite. They would push for multiculturalism and diversity, so that it is my thought that these highborn families are really meant to mirror the Nazis or who the media would argue are their counterparts in modern times. The Malfoys are the caricature of those national socialists, carrying blonde hair and blue eyes. But the major villainization here is against the idea of pure-bloodedness. But there are some principal differences between pure-bloodedness and white nationalism. The most important one being that pure-bloodedness is also associated with this egotistical viewpoint of pure-blood wizard supremacy, whereas white nationalists don't want to assert their dominance over other peoples. But before we get into that juicy topic, let's follow the story very quickly. Harry travels to Diagon Alley through the flu network, only to end up in Nocturne Alley, inside a shop known as Borgen and Burks. Here, he overhears a conversation between Lucius Malfoy and his son at Draco. Though if his grades don't pick up, said Mr. Malfoy, more coolly still, that may indeed be all he is fit for. It's not my fault, retorted Draco. The teachers all have favourites. That Hermione Granger. I would have thought you'd be ashamed that a girl of no wizard family beat you in every exam, snapped Mr. Malfoy. Ha, said Harry under his breath, pleased to see Draco looking both abashed and angry. It's the same all over, said Mr. Morgan in his oily voice. Wizard blood is counting for less everywhere. Not with me, said Mr. Malfoy, his long nostrils flaring. No, sir, nor with me, sir, said Mr. Morgan with a deep bow. And then there was a scuffle in Flourish and Blots between Arthur Weasley and Lucius Malfoy. You should have ignored him, Arthur, said Hagrid, almost lifting Mr. Weasley off his feet as he straightened his robes. Rotten to the core, the whole family. Everyone knows that. No, no Malfoy's worth listening to. Bad blood, that's what it is. Come on now, let's get out of here. Bad blood. Recall that mud blood means dirty blood. So it isn't that far off, is it? 
But Hagrid says this against whites, so there's no way that this can be considered racist, obviously. The events of the book take us to Malfoy calling Hermione a mudblood, and then further inward with the attack on Filch's cat, and the foreboding message on the wall. Which brings us to the major point of this video, pure-bloodedness versus white nationalism. Both ideas have several negative connotations surrounding them. In real life, most of the pushback comes from the fact that this was an idea pushed by the Nazi party and was reflective of the views of Hitler himself. In the book, it is similarly associated with the Death Eaters and reflective of Voldemort himself. But to understand these viewpoints and the demonization of it in both real life and by extension the book, we need to remove these negative connotations and look at the ideas themselves. So first, let's look at nationalism as an idea and not associated with anything else. So to answer the question, what is nationalism? I suggest reading an article written by Brett Stevens, who articulated the main points of the idea succinctly and simply for one to understand. See the link in the description below. Nevertheless, here is the definition. Nationalism is the idea that political groups should be constructed based on the idea of nation, or that the population group comprise people of a similar ethnicity, heritage, culture, and language. Essentially, it offers a unique way of defining the nation, that is, through ethnic groups and shared principles. Currently, nations around the world are defined by their borders, legal systems, and economies, which are known as nation-states. Which means that what unites the people within the nation is ideology and finance, versus culture, heritage, language, and ethnicity. This definition is supported also by Encyclopedia Britannica. Nationalism, translated into world politics, implies the identification of the state or nation with the people, or at least the desirability of determining the extent of the state according to ethnographic principles. In the age of nationalism, but only in the age of nationalism, the principle was generally recognized that each nationality should form a state, its state, and that the state should include all members of that nationality. This promotes the idea of ethnic self-determination, which is where any group that combines culture, customs, learning, art, oral histories, with heritage, ethnicity, race, and tribal identity, is allowed to define its own borders, laws, and cultural change. Now, very quickly, I would also like to discuss what is not nationalism. One of the ideas usually conflated with nationalism is that of racial supremacy, and we see that also in Harry Potter. But if we explore the definition of nationalism, we can see that racial supremacy is not tied to nationalism in any way. In the words of Brett Stevens, nationalism is neither the idea of racial supremacy nor its refutation. It is a context to racial aptitude, meaning that in each nation, those who are desired are those from the nation only. This is important to note, because this is one of the ways in which people try to push back against the idea of nationalism, or of any advocacy for one's own people. We will see it with nationalist organizations in real life, as well as in the novel, where the Malfoys are constantly said to think themselves better than everyone else. This criticism is often heard against people holding these ideas, but never heard from the people themselves. Another idea that is conflated with nationalism is that of patriotism, where one who has patriotism for his nation-state is a nationalist, which is obviously opposite to the initial premise. And now that we have a better understanding of nationalism, and we see ideas such as diversity and multiculturalism, a natural opposites to this idea, one thing I would like to mention is that nationalism in today's society is fine for minority groups to advocate for in their home countries, but not for whites to advocate for in theirs. But in order to understand why white nationalism in particular has been so heavily demonized, we need to reintroduce those negative connotations with nationalism, namely the Nazi party and World War II. 
In order to understand why Hitler, in particular, was presented as this great villain in the context of the war, I'd advise listening to speeches made by historian David Irving. In particular, either his speech on Churchill's war, or the manipulation of history, which have similar talking points. Though each of these are close to two hours long, so I will attempt to summarize the major points. Quite quickly, one would learn that their preconceptions of the war and of Adolf Hitler is largely colored by what is heard of him online, in the media, and in Hollywood, whereas the actual black and white of it is rather different. Another prominent figure that has been praised is Winston Churchill, who actually sought the war on Germany rather than the other way around. Why do I say that we could have got out of the war in June 1940? People are going to say, and I'm sure fewer people in this room than outside in the street in Toronto would say, Irving, how can you say, how can you spout such rubbish and nonsense and heresy getting out of the war in June 1940 after Britain's streets were a, a, a sea of flames, after you were fighting the devil incarnate, you had to do it, there was no choice, the British Empire was at stake. Well, the answer is, Britain's streets were not a sea of flames. Hitler had, in fact, flatly forbidden any kind of air raids on Britain. There were no bombing raids on British towns. London was completely embargoed until the summer of 1940. But of course, history now is viewed differently through the lenses of the television media of the world. Not one bomb fell on a British town, civilian target, until August 1940, until in fact, September the 6th, 1940, when the first air raids took place on London in retaliation for eight raids by Churchill on Berlin. That is the first truth. The second truth, the ugliest truth of all is, as we find in the archives when we read them, that nowhere is there the slightest evidence that Adolf Hitler threatened Britain or the British Empire. Quite the contrary. He made a peace offer to the British in June 1940. Again in July, he had been hinting at it ever since the 1930s, and he repeated this peace offer right through until 1941, 1942. Rudolf Hess, who flew to Scotland in 1941, brought the peace offer in his pocket, which is why Hess is to this day still in prison, 92 years old in Spandau, incommunicado, 25 years in solitary confinement, not allowed to speak to anybody, allowed to visit once a month from his son to talk about family matters, forbidden to talk about politics, because Hess knows the truth about the peace offer which we, we turned down in 1940. The peace offer to the British Empire, which Hitler made in June 1940, was as follows. I will withdraw all German forces from everywhere in Europe, except for the provinces which had always been German and which had been taken away from Germany at the end of the First World War. He didn't want any part of Poland or Czechoslovakia or Norway or France, except what had always been German. It was the great German dream. And as for France and Britain, although we had damaged Germany a great deal with our declaration of war and the hostilities since then, he offered to the British in this peace offer, which is in the British files, if you go to the archives now, and it's in the German files, of course, he offered to the British the following terms. I have the greatest admiration for Britain and the British Empire. I want the British Empire to survive in perpetuity and grow larger and larger. If the British Empire should at any time in my lifetime, Hitler's lifetime, be, be threatened by any outside force, including the Japanese, the Russians, the Soviet Union, who were Hitler's own allies, I guarantee that I will provide to the British whatever forces they may ask for to help to throw these aggressors out of the British Empire. And if you people say, and if the people outside in the street say, David Irving, how can you spout this heresy about making peace in 1940 with that arch devil, Adolf Hitler? Then the answer is, it isn't just David Irving who's saying we could have made peace on June the 23rd, 1940. Winston Churchill said it. Winston Churchill, in his secret cabinet meeting on June the 23rd, 1940, actually said to his war cabinet, the inner cabinet, I think we would be wrong not to accept the peace offer which Mr. Hitler has made to us, provided that we can secure the necessary guarantees of sovereignty for the empire and the Commonwealth countries. I can see you're hushed by that because now you're realizing I'm not just spouting propaganda at you. If Churchill himself said this on June the 23rd, 1940, why in God's name didn't he go ahead and do the morally courageous thing which was to realize that the war was a lost concern and that by fighting it any longer we couldn't help Poland but we would damage the British Empire which on balance was far more important for the future of the world than what happened to Poland which really was no concern of ours. And why, you may ask, did Churchill not continue and make peace on that day or the next? Well, the answer is that over the next two or three days, you find Churchill considering doing a peace deal with Hitler, with that man, again on June the 23rd, June the 26th, and again on a few days in July. But on each occasion, of course, he's gone home to his uh, bunker in Downing Street under 17 feet of concrete. He's gone home to his bunker and he's slapped himself on the head and he's said to himself, my God, what am I saying? I must be out of my mind. If we make peace with Hitler tomorrow, then I am finished the day after. 
Winston Churchill would never have been retained as Prime Minister by the British, and Winston Churchill in June 1940 was a man who had only disasters to his name. Why were we fighting the Second World War from 1941 onwards, 42 onwards? What about Dieppe? Why were we helping the Russians to invade Europe? And why were we defeating the one man who was prepared to put up a Bolshevik against the Russians, Adolf Hitler? We told ourselves that we were fighting the devil incarnate. He did all that to the Jews, therefore it was right that we should do everything we can, whatever the cost, in order to defeat him. Well, even this turns out to be untrue because there is not the slightest evidence that Adolf Hitler knew whatever was happening about the Jews, about the Holocaust, about Auschwitz. I've offered again and again £1,000 English money, 2000 Canadian dollars, to any historian or private person or institute. I've made this offer in 1977. I've made it ever since over the last nine years in television programs, the media, all the way around the world. £1,000 to anybody who can find one wartime document showing that Adolf Hitler even knew about Auschwitz or about whatever was going on on the Eastern Front in that particular historical region. And they can't find it. And they huff and they puff, and they all look at each other, all these academic historians, and they say, Jekyll, you've got the proof somewhere, haven't you? And Jekyll says, no, I haven't got it. Hilgruber has it. And Hilgruber says, no, I haven't got it. Jakobsen has it. And Jakobsen says, but I quoted Boschart. And Boschart says, but I thought you had it, Jekyll. And so they go round and round. They all thought that the other person had the evidence. And while they, because they can't prove that they've got the evidence, they all round on me and say, Irving is a fascist, don't believe him, he's discredited. Nobody accepts what he's got. Well, I've come up in the archives with a whole string of documents, which goes even further than this. Genuine documents that meet my criteria, genuine documents written by people in the position to know, documents that uh, uh, have been created not for some exterior or ulterior motive. Genuine documents, a string of documents, a narrow file of documents showing Hitler deliberately explicitly linked to the Holocaust, as we can say, or linked to the fate of the Jews, that great tragedy. And all these documents show Hitler intervening, trying to stop anything nasty happening to the Jews. There's not one single document showing the other direction of Hitler whipping up the murderers and saying, do this, do that, you're not working hard enough. And I'm going to quote a few examples to you. They're in my book on Hitler, the Hitler's War or the War Pass. On November the 8th, 1923, that Hitler had heard from a policeman who gave evidence in the Hitler trial a few, days, a few weeks later. This policeman said, this policeman said, I overheard Adolf Hitler saying, being told that one of the Nazi units had gone berserk in downtown Munich and had ransacked a Jewish shop and had stolen all its property. And Hitler ordered the commander of that unit into his presence, stripped him of all his unit badges and insignature, threw him out of the Nazi party on, that, on the spot and also ordered him to produce a list of all the names of his unit. And he said, neither you nor any member of your unit will ever again be accepted in a patriotic organization. I personally will take care of that. You have brought the entire movement into discredit. That was back in 1923, and it goes right through to 1944, all this string of documents, which you won't see quoted anywhere else, because it doesn't fit in with the romantic notion, the Hollywood legend, the Madison Avenue legend, the one which we fought the Second World War over, if we now look back in hindsight on that ghastly tragedy. But of course, this is unfashionable to say this, because the whole media, even now for various reasons, is concentrated, is focused exclusively on World War II and the devil incarnate, which is why we British had to fight him and why we are proud now to be bankrupt. This is basically the story of the Second World War. The biggest lie, the biggest lie of the 20th century is that, that we had no alternative but to fight the Second World War because we were fighting the devil incarnate. And now we understand why it is so rooted in the minds of everyone that Hitler was evil. He was the devil incarnate, and so his ideas and ideologies must also be evil. And this idea has deeply permeated the hearts and minds of most British folk, and so it comes as no surprise that J.K. Rowling decided to use this in her book. And I'm not blaming her for her portrayal of these characters and ideas, but I do seek to dispel the notion that these ideas are evil in any way or form. This is not a defense of Hitler or the Nazi party. But nationalism has been painted in a negative light because of this connection to the Nazi party and World War II. But let's look at some other examples of nationalism. Some other famous nationalists include the likes of Theodor Herzl, Marcus Garvey, Chiang Kai-shek, Osiris Akebala, and Oswald Mosley. But I won't go into any of these figures because they are quite famous and have many things written on them. But what about nationalists who are alive today in modern times? We have the likes of Jared Taylor, Greg Johnson, Red Eyes TV, Morgoth Review on YouTube, and perhaps one of the largest nationalist groups today, Patriotic Alternative in the UK. Since they are one of the largest nationalist groups, I would like to speak a little bit more on them. 
from the Patriotic Alternative website, Patriotic Alternative is a community building and activism group that was founded in September 2019 by Mark Collett. Our aim is to raise awareness of such issues as the demographic decline of native Britons in the United Kingdom, the environmental impact of mass immigration, and the indoctrination and political bias taking place in British schools. We believe community building is important because, although the situation in the United Kingdom at present may be dire, being around like-minded people who care about the issues that you care about helps you to understand that you are not alone. It also allows us to form networks with talented people and collectivize as a group against the threats our nation faces. Now all of these sound really great, but let's take a look at some of their other activities as well. Activities such as their hiking and camping trips, they have a homeless outreach initiative, the Great British Cleanup, which is where they clean up um, rubbish around the country. They have celebrations for the Harvest Festival and even regional fitness clubs. But these activities aren't what the media choose to report on. Instead, they focus on leafleting campaigns and banner drops such as these and classify them as racist or supremacist based on the advocacy for their own people. But I'll say once more that nationalism is neither the idea of racial supremacy nor its refutation. To address the media's characterizations of them as white supremacists and racists, I've found this not to be true. And this is judging from watching their streams on Odyssey and looking at their posts on social media such as Telegram. And what you'll find is that these are very average, everyday people. They're good, kind people just like us who wish to advocate for their own people and protect their own people which I don't think is a bad thing in any sense. And this could be said for all of the other nationalists that I mentioned as well. So please don't take my word for it. Head over to each of their websites. Links will be in the description below and have a look for yourself. But I'm sure, and I would be willing to bet money on this, that you will find that what I'm saying is true. But now that we understand the context behind this idea, and how it was manipulated by World War II propaganda to instill this anti-white sentiment in the hearts and minds of many, we can look at its merit in the novel. So let's return now to the point where Hermione was called a mudblood. It's about the most insulting thing he could think of, gasped Ron, coming back up. Mudblood's a really foul name for someone who is muggle-born. You know, non-magic parents. There are some wizards, like Malfoy's family, who think they're better than everyone else because they're what people call pure blood. I mean, the rest of us know it doesn't make any difference at all. Look at Neville Longbottom. He's pure blood and he can hardly stand a cauldron the right way up. It's a disgusting thing to call someone, said Ron. Dirty blood, see. Common blood. It's ridiculous. Most wizards these days are half blood anyway. If we hadn't married muggles, we'd have died out. So, in the book, The first thing they do is insist that those wizards who advocate for pure-bloodedness do so from a supremacist standpoint. They view themselves as better than those of mixed blood, and this is not representative of nationalism as we so rightly pointed out earlier. So this is one of the major differences between this idea of pure-bloodedness and nationalism. But what Ron also pointed out was that if they hadn't married muggles, the wizarding population would have died out. Now, this doesn't seem to make much sense. We already established from the first novel that magic is clearly hereditary. One has to have some magical ancestry in order to obtain magical ability. Hermione had to have inherited her gift from one of her magical ancestors, and J.K. Rowling also admits that this is how it works. But this now begs the question, Couldn't constant interrelations with muggles actually cause a saturation of the wizarding community? To understand this, let's look at it from a genetic point of view. If wizards kept their relations amongst fellow witches and wizards, then it would stand to reason that the majority of their sons and daughters would be wizards or witches as well. For those mixing with muggles, it becomes less likely that this trait would present thereby producing regular children alongside wizarding children. And finally, when those non-magical children of wizards marry non-magical children of muggles, 
then the result would be mainly muggles and the occasional witch or wizard, like Hermione. And this can be further reinforced by looking at the inheritability of traits through generations in real life. In the book, there is also the presence of squibs, who are non-magical children to two magical parents, but they are said to be quite rare, and therefore should be regarded as the exception and not the rule. Regardless, the big takeaway here is that if the wizards were to continuously intermarry muggles, there would be a decrease in the wizarding population, and if the trend continued, then there would be very few witches and wizards being born in the future. So, the advocacy for pure-bloodedness in the novel isn't unwarranted. There does seem to be a genuine concern about the replacement of wizards and witches. However, the idea is messy and incoherent, because those same people who advocate for pure-bloodedness would refuse to marry a witch or wizard who was half-blood or muggle-born. The terminology is rather confusing as well, because even though both Harry's parents were wizards, he is considered a half-blood because his mother was muggle-born. There isn't sufficient evidence to know whether being half-blooded or muggle-born increased the chance of producing squibs, so we don't know if their arguments have any sort of merit to them. Draco Malfoy pointed out an interesting talking point in the first novel, where he commented about the culture difference between wizards brought up through wizarding households and those brought up under muggle households. But, through all the exploration of the theme in this book, they never bring that to light either. Therefore, the major argument in the novel advocating for pure-bloodedness seems to be supremacy, which should separate it from any nationalist movement today. Continuing with the story, as the attacks on the Muggleborns continue throughout the semester, the students become more concerned. In the book, one of their professors explains the legend surrounding the Chamber of Secrets, but here it is from the movie. Professor. I was wondering if you could tell us about the Chamber of Secrets. Very well. Well, you all know, of course, that Hogwarts was founded over a thousand years ago by the four greatest witches and wizards of the age. Godric Gryffindor, Helga Hufflepuff, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Salazar Slytherin. Now, three of the founders coexisted quite harmoniously. One did not. Three guesses who? Salazar Slytherin wished to be more selective about the students admitted to Hogwarts. He believed magical learning should be kept within all magic families, in other words, pure bloods. Unable to sway the others, he decided to leave the school. Now, according to legend, Slytherin had built a hidden chamber in this castle known as the Chamber of Secrets. Well, shortly before departing, he sealed it until that time when his own true heir returned to the school. The heir alone would be able to open the chamber and unleash the horror within and by so doing, purge the school of all those who, in Slytherin's view, were unworthy to study magic. Now, Salazar Slytherin is shown to be unlikable, and Ron attested this after class. Again, this reinforces the idea that only nasty characters support pure-bloodedness and advocacy for their own people. The entire school begins to wonder who the heir of Slytherin could be. The trio are quick to suspect Malfoy, but everyone else is quick to suspect Harry, because it was revealed that he could speak Parseltongue. I'm a what? You can talk to snakes. You were there. You heard me. I heard you speaking Parseltongue. Snake language? I spoke a different language. Harry, listen to me. There's a reason the symbol of Slytherin House is a serpent. Salazar Slytherin was a parcel mouth. He could talk to snakes too. The trio are still convinced it is Malfoy and through a series of events, managed to create the Polyjuice Potion, which allows them to assume the appearances of Grab and Goyle, and question Malfoy. Arthur Weasley loves Muggles so much, he should snap his wand in half and go and join them, said Malfoy scornfully. You'd never know the Weasleys were purebloods the way they behave. Ron's, or rather, Crab's, face contorted with fury. What's up with you, Crab? snapped Malfoy. Stomachy, Ron grunted. 
Well, go up to the hospital wing and give all those mudbloods a kick from me, said Malfoy, snickering. You know, I'm surprised the Daily Prophet hasn't reported all these attacks yet. I suppose Dumbledore is trying to hush it all up. He'll be sacked if it doesn't stop soon. Father's always said old Dumbledore is the worst thing that's ever happened to this place. He loves Muggleborns. A decent headmaster would never let slime like that creepy in. Saint Potter, the Mudbloods' friend, said Malfoy slowly. He's another one with no proper wizard feeling. Or he wouldn't go wrong with that jumped up Granger Mudblood. And people think he's Slytherin heir? Harry and Ron waited with bated breath. Malfoy was surely seconds away from telling them it was him. But then... I wish I knew who it is, said Malfoy petulantly. I could help them. Harry then asks if Malfoy has any idea who the heir of Slytherin could be. To which he responds, You know I haven't, Goyle. How many times do I have to tell you, snapped Malfoy. And father won't tell me anything about the last time the chamber was opened either. Of course, it was 50 years ago, so it was before his time. But he knows all about it, and he says that it was all kept quiet, and it'll look suspicious if I know too much about it. But I know one thing. Last time the Chamber of Secrets was opened, a mudblood died. So I bet it's a matter of time before one of them's killed this time. I hope it's Granger, he said with relish. Malfoy's views are rather severe, bearing in mind that he would only be 12 years old in the book at this time. The obvious inference people would draw here is that these ideas came from his father, and that these ideas naturally led to this sort of sadism and cruelty against non-purebloods. However, we've discussed this at length already, and we see that this isn't the case in real life. White nationalists are not the ones trying to force their ideology on children. However, the same cannot be said for the left, who constantly push their agenda on children, forcing them to accept and be members of the LGBT community and even go so far as to convince these children to undergo life-changing surgery, which mutilate their own bodies. Furthering the story, Harry comes across the diary of Tom Riddle, a past student of Hogwarts. The diary is enchanted to contain his memories, and so he shows Harry that Hagrid was accused of opening the chamber previously. After Hermione herself is attacked, Harry and Ron are forced to go and question Hagrid. Before they can, however, he is arrested by the Ministry of Magic who, funnily enough, don't actually suspect Hagrid, but a saving face, by making it look as though the Ministry was doing something proactive about the situation. Hagrid advises Harry and Ron to follow the spiders. They follow the spiders into the Forbidden Forest, where they come face to face with a creature known as Aragog. Aragog gives Harry and Ron some key pieces of information, and when they return to the castle, Harry pieces it together. What was the point of sending us in there? What have we found out? I'd like to know. That Hagrid never opened the Chamber of Secrets, said Harry. He was innocent. Later in the common room, Ron, he hissed through the dark. Ron! Ron woke with a yelp and saw Harry. Ron, that girl who died. Aragog said she was found in a bathroom. What if she never left the bathroom? What if she's still there? Ron rubbed his eyes, frowning through the moonlight, and then he understood too. You don't think. Not moaning Myrtle, then everything makes sense when they visit Hermione in the hospital wing the next day. Of the many fearsome beasts and monsters that roam our land, there is none more curious or more deadly than the Basilisk, known also as the King of Serpents. Its methods of killing are most wondrous, for aside from its deadly and venomous fangs, the Basilisk has a murderous stare, and all who are fixed with the beam of its eye shall suffer instant death. Spiders flee before the basilisk, for it is their mortal enemy, and the basilisk flees only from the crowing of the rooster, which is fatal to it. Beneath this, a single word had been written, in a hand Harry recognised as Hermione's. Pipes. It was as though somebody had just flicked a light on in his brain. Ron, this is it. This is the answer. The monster in the chamber is a basilisk, a giant serpent. That's why I've been hearing that voice all over the place, and nobody else has heard it. It's because I understand parcel tongue. Harry looked up at the beds around him. The basilisk kills people by looking at them, but no one's died, because no one looked it straight in the eye. Colin saw it through his camera. The basilisk burned up all all the film inside it, but Colin just got petrified. Justin. Justin must have seen the basilisk through nearly headless Nick. And Hermione and that Ravenclaw prefect were found with a mirror next to them. Ron's jaw had dropped. And Mrs. Norris? 
The water, he said slowly. The flood from Morning Myrtle's bathroom. I bet you Mrs. Norris only saw the reflection. He scanned the page in his hand eagerly. The more he looked at it, the more it made sense. The crowing of the rooster is fatal to it, he read aloud. Hagrid's roosters were killed. The heir of Slytherin didn't want anyone near the castle once the chamber was opened. Spiders flee before it. It all fits. But how's the basilisk been getting around the place, said Ron. A giant snake? Someone would have seen. Harry, however, pointed out the word Hermione had scribbled at the foot of the page. Pipes, he said. Pipes, Ron. It's been using the plumbing. I've been hearing that voice inside the walls. Ron suddenly grabbed Harry's arm. The entrance to the Chamber of Secrets, he said hoarsely. What if it's in a bathroom? What if it's in... Moaning Myrtle's bathroom, said Harry. But before they can alert the teacher, they overheard that Ginny Weasley, Ron's younger sister, had been taken into the chamber, which would have meant she would have been killed. Gilderoy is given the burden of rescuing her, and so Harry and Ron thought they ought to help him. But let's speak briefly about Gilderoy Lockhart first. Let me introduce you to your new defense against the dark arts teacher. Me. Gilderoy Lockhart, Order of Merlin, third class, honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League, and five times winner of Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award. But I don't talk about that. I didn't get rid of the band and banshee by smiling at them. <laughs> <laughs> No. Gilderoy Lockhart is a celebrity in the wizarding world who performed many famous acts as he writes so passionately in his books and tells to anyone within earshot. In actuality, he was a fraud who stole the accolades of famous witches and wizards to boost his popularity, fame and fortune. But what's interesting about Gilderoy is that he constantly puts himself in the spotlight, offering information and opinions on things he really knows nothing about. And most intelligent people identify him as the fraud he is immediately. This happens rather quickly with the men in the series, like Harry and Ron, who are immediately skeptical of his abilities from their first lesson. Whereas people like Molly Weasley and Hermione are so taken by him and his books that they are willing to overlook the evidence blatantly staring them in the face. He is also incredibly annoying and obnoxious to deal with. Personally, I think that Gilderoy Lockhart has some similarities with the left-wing archetype known as the Skintellectual, who claim to be experts on everything but really don't know what they're talking about. But one of the principal differences between them and him is that these modern intellectuals try to denigrate the ideas of accomplished people in an attempt to belittle their accomplishments, whereas Gilderoy Lockhart seeks to steal these accomplishments for himself and essentially be these great and important people. Before I wrap up, there are a few subversions in the movie to quickly mention. Firstly, Draco Malfoy's character was slightly exaggerated so that he would be portrayed as more cold-hearted and unfeeling toward other people. Whereas in the book, the only scene that really stands out was the one already mentioned in this video. Second, Ron is made to look a bit wimpier in the film, which introduced a bit of comedy admittedly but it does take a bit away from Ron's character. And finally, there are some more subtle subversions with Hermione. She fixes Harry's glasses again in Diagon Alley. She immobilizes the pixies in defense against the dark arts. And she destroyed the bludger after the Quidditch match, none of which was present in the books. They also made it out that Hermione knew what the term mudblood had meant and it deeply upset her in the movie, driving her to the point of tears. But in the book, she had no idea what the term meant and it didn't seem to bother her at all. None of these take away from the movie in any significant way, but they do culminate into the overall message they'd like to push. Now, finishing the story, Harry, Ron and Gilderoy enter the hidden entrance to the Chamber of Secrets in an attempt to rescue Ginny. And so, in the cave, he overpowers Ron and attempts to erase their memories. But the spell backfires and causes a cave-in. Now separated, Harry goes on alone and faces the culprit behind the Chamber of Secrets and the attacks, 
who turns out to be Tom Riddle. The very same riddle that was preserved in the pages of the diary. He explained how he had entranced Ginny into committing these crimes, and how he was taking her life force so that he could become whole once again. During the speech, Harry shows great loyalty to Dumbledore, which calls Fawkes, Dumbledore's phoenix, to him. Fawkes came with the sorting hat from which Harry was able to pull the sword of Godric Gryffindor. Fawkes blinds the basilisks so that Harry could fight it, and he kills the beast by plunging the sword through its skull. One of the creatures' fangs, however, sink into Harry's flesh, which would have killed him, but Fawkes healed him with, with his tears, and then gave Harry the diary. Without thinking, he took the basilisk fang and stabbed the diary out of anger against Tom Riddle, but what this does is actually ends up destroying Tom and giving Ginny her strength back. They leave the chamber and Harry frees Dobby from Lucius, who, it was revealed, had given Ginny the book, the diary of Tom Riddle, in the first place. After the freeing of Dobby, the book ends on a very positive and heartwarming note. Now, some themes recur from before, such as Harry's priorities, which were focused on solving the mystery of the Chamber of Secrets and thereby saving those who were in danger. Talent gets another mention by Hermione in this book as well. At least no one on the Gryffindor team had to buy their way in. They got in on pure talent. And Harry's worthiness to pull the sword of Gryffindor and Dumbledore's comment about choices further emphasised that choices determine who a person was and whether they could be good or evil. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do that defines me. Now one of the major things we talked about in this book is that we see how the perceptions of certain ideas tend to colour the way J.K. Rowling writes about certain characters in her book. Her concept of what constitutes as evil or wrong has been manipulated by World War II propaganda, and the propaganda present in most modern Hollywood films, namely ideas about black slavery and white nationalism, both of which seek to instill this anti-white sentiment in the hearts and minds of many. And, the, and these parallels are drawn mainly by the left as well. But we have dispelled the misconceptions surrounding both. And in future novels, we will look closer at the author herself, perhaps in the fourth installment, with the return of Voldemort, as it brings into question her ideas of good and evil. With that said, it brings us to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, consider giving it a like or a dislike if you didn't. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, subscribe for more. And if you would like to support this channel, consider checking out The Guardians of Aria on Amazon, where you can send cash donations through Odyssey or PayPal. See the link in the description for more details. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.